The small ruby that everyone wants has fallen out in the road. Some people say it lies to the east of us. Others say to the west of us. Some say in deep waters. Still others say in primitive earth rocks. Kabir's instinct told him that it was inside and what it was worth. So he wrapped it carefully in his heart cloth. The small ruby that everyone wants has fallen out in the road. Some people say it lies in so many things. Wealth, youth, power, children, degrees, travel, vacations. The latest this, the bestest that. Control over this or that. Some say it lies in primitive earth rocks, deep waters. Kabir's instinct told him that it was inside and what it was worth. So he wrapped it carefully in his heart cloth. Good morning, my friends. Thank you for making the effort to get up and come today. The party wouldn't happen without you. The meditative journey is in a certain way a very solitary one. But it's one that we do and must do in community. So I invite you for a minute or two to turn toward a neighbor and introduce yourself and mm, why don't you just tell them something that's important to you this morning. Could be anything.
slightly different procedure today. I'm going to pass around this basket, which has cards and paper pencils in it. And I'm going to ask you that if you have a question you'd like to pose, if you'd write it down, and then we'll pass this after the movement practice. And that will give me some guidance as to what the question of our community is for today. So I'm going to give this to you and just, thanks. Huh? Yeah. yeah. No, I'd like to pass it now so that it gets to people and they have some chance to hold it in the hand and thanks. Come in. Come in, come in. Have a seat. I was just talking with the newcomers today. Oh, who's, raise your hand if you're here for the first time. Quite a few new faces, welcome. Hope, it, hope this turns out to be a worthy effort this morning. So I was speaking about the Four Noble Truths. And one piece that I always come to in those introductory sessions is that I look upon this as the scientific method. That there's nothing to believe. The Buddha was very clear in saying, don't believe me. When he was asked by the Kalamas, why should we believe you? His response was, don't. Also, don't throw the baby out with the bed. Don't presume there isn't anything here. But this is not a path of belief. It's not a path of blind faith. It's a path of direct experience. And we see in the world the catastrophe of blind faith in ideologies. It's all over the place. And so I encourage us all to, to undertake the experiment. That one way to speak of it is the Buddha, Buddha taught that the three three central character, characteristics of the, of the universe are impermanence, which is that nothing lasts. Everything is in constant change. And it's not sort of everything, it's literally everything. In every nanosecond. And secondly, the truth of dukkha, of, of unsatisfactoriness or, ch or stress. That, even simply because everything's in constant change, we don't arrive somewhere and then be, ah, I've arrived. It's always dissolving around us. And the third, which is really the jewel of the Buddhist teachings, is that uh, this that I take, we take as me and mine, uh, while very real, is transient and not permanent either. And that in fact who we are is the infinite mysterious universe manifesting as this. And uh, to realize that is to be free. Anicca dukkha anatta is the term. So we do this, the experiment is done by, uh, it's an N of one, each of us is the experimental subject. And uh, we find a comfortable way to sit. Uh, the Buddha sat cross-legged because he was from India, not because cross-legged sitting is the ultimate spiritual position. Every position is the ultimate spiritual position. And so we sit down comfortably upright. Eyes can be open or closed.
and we bring awareness to the present moment and one way to do that is to become aware of in breathing and out breathing the sensations in the chest and abdomen or at the nostrils and breathing only happens now right we can't breathe a breath from yesterday or from five minutes ago or tomorrow there's only this breath right now so anytime awareness is engaged with this breath in this moment there's life you're present in life of course the mind is profoundly conditioned to wander to create images of past and future fortunately we don't have to go to battle with that that's a bit like going to battle with the weather what we can do however is to become aware of it and there's nothing in the universe stronger than this awareness So coming home to the actual sensations of life in the, in the body. when you um, when you discover that the mind is wandering it's a perfect opportunity to see what the mind does what the nature of the mind is just had a, um, a realization in terms of when the, if the, bas when the basket comes to you, uh, please, if you want to write a question, please take a pencil or pen and a piece of paper and pass the basket on. We'll pick them up after. So we are students of the human experience. What's happening in this moment?
Each breath has a beginning. It really comes out of nowhere. It isn't there and then it is. How intimate can you be with this breath? In well-designed experimental science, we do our best to observe the results of the experiment without bias. We really want to see what does the experiment reveal? What is the nature or the experience 
of this moment when the intention is to bring awareness into in-breathing and out-breathing. And this illuminates the actuality of life experience.
perhaps this is one of those times when the mind grows still. The experiment becomes a little more subtle then. To abide in the present moment in what could be called choiceless awareness. And no longer making much effort to stay with the breath, but simply being open to the arising and disappearing of phenomena, of experiences. Much of the time, however, especially at the beginning, we have the experiences of sense desire, aversion, restlessness, sloth and torpor, dullness and doubt, and the whole pantheon of emotions. And so we learn to be present with them with great love and compassion.
the only somewhere to get to in meditation is here, now. To this breath, to these body sensations, to these thoughts. This is how life is manifesting as and through you right now. We tend to think of meditation as something that we do in a special posture, at a special time of day, with special accoutrements. More realistically, meditation is an attitude to life. And soon there will be a gong, two gongs actually, which indicate the end of this time of sitting together. Then some movement practice will occur. And then something else will occur, and then something else will occur for the rest of our lives. This is the practice of being present and alive and awake to our entire life in all of its pleasure and all of its pain. And through this we become much more loving, much more conscious, much more compassionate. I think with the, with the bowl, now let's put it on the back table and if anyone wants to add a question to it, please make your way back there at some point.
Please raise your hand if your experience is of something about greater stability and ease or basic sanity now than when you walked in the front door. Take a moment to look around, my friends. So carrying out this brief experiment, it's obvious that half an hour, 40 minutes a day of practice is very functional. So of course everyone does, right? <laughs> We humans are an odd lot. <laughs> Mr. Jim, would you be so kind as to lead some movement? Okie doke, we're standing, breathing. In touch with the floor. <coughs> Bodies alive and still functional. <coughs> we can take the weight a little bit to one side and then to another, the other side, and notice how just expressing that intention to sway a little bit, the body knows how to balance with maybe one heel off the floor, and then back the other way, with one heel off the floor. The body takes on some sort of a unifying awareness from the feet to the top of the head, and arranges things so we don't fall over. That's very fortunate. <coughs> and if we want to place our feet underneath our shoulders and sink into the knees and come back up, you can feel the body as sort of a piston. It has power to lift and a controlled descent. And again, we express the intention and then the body goes to work and coordinates all kinds of feedback systems. We're not going too far, we're not going forward, we're not going back. This time we're gonna lift the arms up uh, in front of us and we still have a notion of balance arising in the body as this intention to lift the arms starts. The body compensates with functional awareness They're coming at me from all sides. Can I trust this woman? <laughs> Lift and open. Thank you. Okay, now we have the shoulders and the chest open and relaxed. We can reach overhead, paint a rainbow.
And just as we do when we sit, we notice the mind wander. Then we come back to the next gesture. What is the next gesture? Sinking, crossing the wrists, lifting up. One gesture leads to another. We do our best to stay with the sensations in the arms and the hands, the feet in touch with the floor, the legs. Moving upward. And then a more interesting move. Open to the side, palms up. Bring one hand in and push with the other. Lots to keep track of here. And then if this is safe for your body, bring your arms back and turn your shoulders all the way around and sink. And we'll lift the cross like the sun is rising. And all the weight moves into one leg. The heel comes off the floor and the body knows how to stay in control of an upright body. A rhythmic dance of cooperation. A mind aware of a body moving, turning, gazing at the moon. using the imagination to organize a new gesture. Pressing across, coming across the midline, pushing back, across the midline. Even as the arm extends, some part of the body stays aware of this central axis and feeds back information. Don't go too far. You fall on your nose. Reach up. Focus on the palm. Let the other palm trace a path beneath. <coughs> cloud drifting across the sky. When the 
mind and the body work together, there's a relaxation, an easy coordination. Okay, we're halfway through with our feet in a stable position. Then we'll <coughs> open the stance a bit and shift the weight more forward into one leg and more back into the other. Larger movements, bigger breath. Riding the waves. Opening the arms. And back to the other side. <clears throat> Opening the stance and splashing in the sea. Lifting the toe as the arms extend. Make the back leg support more weight. And ride the waves. Opening the arms. And back to the center. Feel that balance and that stability. <clears throat> Both feet under the shoulders, sink. Make a fist and let the dragon rise from the sea. Feel the power in the legs. And a little more control up on the toes. We'll Spread the wings and soar. Then turn the wheel. Change direction. And back to the center. Again, pausing to feel that stability. <coughs> Shifting the weight into one leg so we can lift an arm and a leg.
And then the final move is just up and in, and then release. Then when we come to stillness, we have a, a body that's very awake. We've opened up joints and hinges and tendons and bones and muscles. <coughs> Encouraging a flow of energy through the body when we pause and look and feel there's plenty to follow there's little sensations throughout the body just indicating all this aliveness all this awareness from the bottoms of the feet to the crown of the head hopefully there's nothing Asleep, nothing stagnating, everything open and alert. So just a simple scan of the body tells us again how impermanent every moment of consciousness is. We're conscious of something deep inside the body. We're conscious of fabric on the surface of the skin. Conscious of thoughts arising about the past or the future. And maybe a habit to come back to the feet remembering our connection to the earth and we'll bring our hands together in gratitude for being here and sharing this with everyone else thank you <clears throat> and who's on for a t announcements no one I'm filling in for Kate on the announcements today. Thank you for the riches, thanks.
I didn't check this one. Test one, two. Oh, it is. Test one, two, yes. Michael, would you speak about the climate march, please? Thank you, Robert. Fellow Sangha members, this is the third week in a row that I've been up here. And um, this time, I have something that I wanted to share with you. Um, I was asked to participate in the Portland Interfaith Pilgrimage for Climate Justice. And I was a little bit late to join the planning committee but one of the roles that I took on was to put together a book, which we will use uh, in the pilgrimage later on today that starts at 2 o'clock at Haveru Shalom downtown. Um, and this book um, is called Climate Change Statements from the World's Religions. And it includes 21 faith communities' uh, highest leaders' statements on climate change and most of them are letters to the UN world leaders asking them to uh, garner up the willpower to do what is needed. And there are several in here, and uh, I could read to you the Jewish rabbinic letter on climate change or the Hindu declaration on climate change or the Sikh first Sikh statement on climate change, but I think I'll read to you the climate change statement to world leaders from the global, global Buddhist climate collective. Has anyone here read that? Okay, good. So it'll be new material for most of you. I think it's, it's very powerful and poetic. And I love the way the, the message of Buddhism is interwoven into this letter. We, the undersigned Buddhist leaders, come together prior to the 21st session of the Conference of Parties to the, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris in order to add our voices to the growing calls for world leaders to cooperate with compassion and wisdom and reach an ambitious and effective climate agreement. We are at a crucial crossroads where our survival and that of other species is at stake as a result of our actions. There is still time to slow the pace of climate change and limit its impacts, but to do so, the Paris summit will need to put us on a path to phase out fossil fuels. We must ensure the protection of the most vulnerable through visionary and comprehensive mitigation and adaptation measures. Our concern is founded on the Buddha's realization of dependent co-arising, in, which interconnects all things in the universe. Understanding this inter interconnected causality and the consequences of our actions are critical steps in reducing our environmental impact. Cultivating the insight of interbeing and compassion, we will be able to act out of love, not fear, to protect our planet. Buddhist leaders have been speaking about this for decades. However, everyday life can easily lead us to forget that our lives are inextricably interwoven with the natural world through every breath we take, the water we drink, and the food we eat. Through our lack of insight, we are destroying the very life support systems that we and all other living beings depend on for survival. We believe it is imperative that the global Buddhist community recognizes both our dependence on one another as well as on the natural world. Together, humanity must act on the root causes of this environmental crisis, which is driven by our use of fossil fuels, unsustainable consumption patterns, lack of awareness, and lack of concern about the consequences of our actions. We strongly support the time to act is now a Buddhist declaration on climate change, which is endorsed by a diverse and global representation of Buddhist leaders and Buddhist sanghas. We also welcome and support the climate change statements of, the religious, of other religious traditions. These include 
Pope Francis encyclical earliest, earlier this year, Laudato Si, on care for our common home, the Islamic declaration on climate change, as well as the Hindu declaration on climate change. We are united by our concern to phase out fossil fuels to reduce our consumption patterns and the ethical imperative to act against both the causes and the impact of climate change, especially on the world's poorest. To this end, we urge world leaders to generate the political will to close the emissions gap left by country climate pledges and ensure that the global temperature increase remains below 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial levels. We also ask for a common commitment to scale up climate finance so as to help developing countries prepare for climate impacts and to help us all <clears throat> transmission, transition to a safe, low-carbon future. The good news is that there is a unique opportunity at the Paris climate negotiations to create a turning point. Scientists assure us that limiting the rise in global average temperature to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius is technologically and economically feasible. Phasing out fossil fuels and moving toward 100% renewable and clean energy will not only spur a global, low-carbon transformation, it will also help us to embark on a much-needed path of spiritual renewal. In addition to our spiritual progression in line with UN recommendations, some of the most effective actions individuals can take are to protect our forests, move toward a plant-based diet, reduce consumption, recycle, switch to renewables, fly less, and take public transport. We can all make a difference. We call on world leaders to recognize and address our universal responsibility to protect the web of life for the benefit of all, now and for the future. And then there are five uh, points that um, basically summarize what was said earlier. I'll end it with their words. Uh, Copenhagen, in two, um, the, time is, the time to act is now, yours sincerely. Global Buddhist Climate Change Collective. And the list of Buddhist leaders is about two and a half pages, maybe three and a half pages long. It's very impressive. I'll just read you the top two. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. So this is just one of the religious statements that's in this book. And I hope that... Um, these words were meaningful and helpful to you. Um, and if there is uh, anyone who hasn't heard the announcement already, uh, there will be the Portland Interfaith pilgrimage this afternoon. Uh, and a group of us are going to be leaving from here, carpooling and some of us bicycling uh, down to northwest Portland. There will be about seven stops. Robert will be giving a contemplation at one of the stops on the park blocks um, just before we go in to end the ceremony at First Unitarian. I think it's going to be a beautiful event, and I encourage everyone to try to make it. Uh, well, we're going to leave from here in uh, carpool and um, bicycle, but we will end at, uh, well, the start of the pilgrimage is at Havra Shalom, which is at the corner of uh, 18th and Davis, Northwest 18th and Davis. And the pilgrimage will leave there approximately 1.45. Everyone's encouraged to arrive there at 1.30. And if you can't do the walk itself, um, you can arrive at First Unitarian Church, which is on the park blocks. <clears throat> and if you arrive there about 3.45, you could catch the ending ceremony, which is going to be uh, quite impressive. I have a mask here. Thank you, Michael. Well done. Hmm. There are delicious goodies to be had at, when we're done here today at noon. Uh, I had a sample to be sure it was safe for everyone. <laughs> and I had a Ritz cracker with cream cheese and Tanya Harding's astounding, it's a, 
It's a green tomato relish, but it's way beyond that. <clears throat> a taste extravaganza. Um, the, we decided to cancel the stewardship circle retreat, which was for next, yesterday. was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> We're canceling the stewardship circle retreat. <laughs> That retreat is, is intended, and we did a terrible job of publicizing it. For those, those people who are uh, monthly contributors to PIMC, to come and have a day of meditation together. And of course, in our, in our inimitable style, everyone can come. Um, but um, there's no suggested fee for the Stewardship Circle participants. And it was, uh, the theme uh, will be, we're gonna reschedule it, uh, compassion and community, and Kate and I will be doing that together. Um, my dear friend, um, Frank, Frank Leder is coming from Germany uh, to stay with me for a few days. He is a Dharma brother with me and with Ruth Dennison. And uh, we have a wonderful connection, and he has created, he's taken the Dharma uh, in many ways and continued the evolution of it to fit his character and his way of being in the world. And he's created a, t a massage system that's really spread throughout Europe, uh, which has to do with being mindfully present. It's called the Touch Life System, he and his wife. And he's coming, and we're doing together an evening on the 17th here and then a day-long retreat on the 18th. And I encourage you to come because it will be, uh, it'll be powerful and playful and uh, it'll, I think it'll be fun to see what happens between Frank and Robert as uh, tw 30 and 40 year students of Ruth Dennison teaching together. So that'll, I, I invite you to do that. Um, those of you that are on the listserv will receive a year-end giving request soon. Uh, we have a goal of $15,000 to raise, which will help us enter the next year uh, completely on budget. And uh, we've done this each year, and it's been very successful in the past. And I encourage you to find that place in your heart that is aware of how the Dharma is influencing your life and how this place, this mysterious organism called Portland Insight Meditation Community uh, supports you and to, uh, to support it in return. There's a Donna basket, it's not, it's a Donna box back there. Uh, of course, we're, you're encouraged to do the monthly donations uh, which help with budgeting purposes and also that you make a contribution when you're not here. Because uh, what we're doing is building something for everyone and to keep the doors open for all the people who come, some in the future. Um, oh, today, following uh, my reflection, Christine Howard, sitting over here, is going to be doing consults, two or three, is it? Is it? Okay, great. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you have questions about the Dharma, uh, you'll discover Christine to be wise, warm, and very contactful. And you can also schedule with Robert. You can do that with Kate. It's one of my great delights that I get to meet with people. I meet for half an hour with folks uh, uh, as per my schedule. And... Uh, it really helps me stay in contact with the community and is, um, it's where I get a lot of my energy is through the personal contact with folks. Hmm.
<laughs> As such things happen. Um, I don't know if it's the first line of a poem, but uh, it's part of a poem that just emerged a moment ago. Uh, the line is this, we are the earth singing. And in response, or in looking forward to this climate gathering this afternoon, a, a, a quote I'm going to read there, one of my favorites, it's from Alan Watts. This feeling of being lonely and very temporary visitors in the universe is in flat contradiction to everything known about humans and all other living organisms in the sciences. We do not come into this world. We come out of it as leaves come out of a tree. As the ocean waves, the universe peoples. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. We are the living earth. We're the earth that has somehow mysteriously become conscious of itself. I mean, mysterious. Could there be anything more mysterious? So I invite you to be aware of awareness. And don't make it into something complicated. Just right now there's seeing or there's touching the carpet or there's knowing that you're here. How does that happen? <laughs> do you do that? I don't. I haven't the least idea how it happens. That it happens is clearer to me than ever. So we are the living earth. We are the earth singing. And this afternoon, a few of us are going to gather to do this walk. <clears throat> to support one another, to, to speak for the earth. Remember the Lorax? I speak for the trees. <clears throat> That's a nice letter. Thank you for reading it. I like the part about love. One of the things, if I can remember to say it today, is, is uh, as we move in this direction of paying greater attention to th that which surrounds us, our living environment, um, we don't have any enemies. The fabled 1% is not the enemy. The oil companies are not the enemy. The nuclear industry is not the en enemy. We don't have enemies. Because it's all us. And any one of us could be in any of these positions. Just depends on which womb you popped out in. If you popped out in a, a womb in... It's one of the countries of the Middle East with in extreme poverty and unemployment. You could be hanging out in the ISIS cult doing horrible things or you could be sitting here in this room. So we don't have enemies. We do have, we do have an imperative to be loving and do what good we can in our lives. But to, to, as soon as we fall into doing it with an enemy in mind, we are the same old problem. I said this at demonstrations way back when uh, with, about Ronald Reagan, and it was, it was a very unpopular message that being, being angry at that poor, it turned out, demented old man um, was the problem. 
didn't mean he didn't need to get out of office and stop doing what he was doing. Though who knows, he did some things apparently were very important. But anyway, it's to, to move beyond enemy imaging and to realize that it's only through cooperation. Communication and cooperation and seeing each other as human beings that we can possibly have healthier relationships, healthier community, and potentially a healthier earth. And it is daunting, isn't it? So, uh, I've decided that we're going to stay here for a week and address all these questions. <laughs> and I thought, I'm, I'm going to read them. These are, this is the voice of, uh, of us. A few weeks ago, you touched on the idea that meditation could be a form of suppression and that formal therapy was a complement to this meditation practice. In my experience, meditation only stops the storyline and the emotions are still rampant and ready to be experienced. I may have misunderstood the relationship between meditation, suppression, therapy. Could you please expound upon these ideas? What is a proper way to breathe during meditation? I can answer that quickly. Absolutely naturally. Don't mess with your breath. If you find that you're controlling the breath, switch to doing hearing meditation. This is not pranayama, the yogic practice. This is not a breath. This is not a self-improvement practice. We, we usually come to it that way. But this is the practice of seeing things vipassana, which means seeing things as they really are. So... One thing about sitting comfortably upright is it lets the breath breathe itself naturally. But th there isn't a proper way. Which doesn't mean to say it's not great to practice diaphragmatic breathing and that the breathing exercises and trainings are not useful. But when it comes to this, we're just letting it be. How does one stay mindful and even compassionate while someone is trying to antagonize you or even has hatred towards you? Our communities at large are falling apart due to many different causes, mostly from the illusory monetary system. What can we do as our own community to help those around us as they lose their homes, especially so in harsh winter weather? In a time of transition without a home, how can we find our true home? You say meditation is best done in community. Why is this so? Aren't these remarkable? Anicca, delusion of time. We have great distress related to the belief that time is real. How should we understand time? What, how does the Buddha grieve death? How do we live intentionally but without expectations? It seems like a paradox. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Can I read the Buddhism letter to the UN? Yes, score. <laughs> humbling, humbling to face such questions. Death is the big question, isn't it? I stumbled upon, uh, it's dangerous when I stumble upon such things, I stumbled upon a TV series, an HBO series, called The Leftovers. Have any of you watched any of that? I'm hooked. 2% of the world's population vanished at a particular moment on a particular date. 
and they just disappeared. So it's not such a big percentage, 2%. However, what it set off in the world was absolute freak out. And it's a very powerful story. That what I, I mean, there's, there's, the usual, there's the usual dramatization and emotion, you know, the, the, the characters that they follow and their, the effect of their own neurotic structures and PTSD and so on. But it's, it's really illuminating about religion and cults, the cult phenomenon, and how, uh, how we, ha we are desperate to make meaning of things. How do you make meaning of this? And um, it's really helping me keep, keep death in mind because just as Just as those people had someone disappear, so could any of us have someone disappear in a heartbeat. Now, it, it wasn't, we would, it, it's not a planetary, well, it is a planetary f phenomenon, right? 125,000 people will die today. <laughs> Gone. Um, and so one of the cults, one of the cults has in mind that they are going to make people face into, <laughs> they're gonna face this reality, they're gonna face death, and they do it in some pretty obnoxious ways. And, uh, but the Buddha was, and the Buddha didn't do it like that, but he did, he did a lot of emphasis on pay attention to death. Remember that this moment is all there is. And uh, I was saying in the group today, the introductory group that, that uh, for some years now, uh, in my home, <laughs> when, when we say goodbye to each other, it's, we don't say drive carefully, we say don't get dead. Literally, I mean, that's how, that's how we part, don't get dead. And because that's what please drive carefully means, of course, isn't it? If you were to die, I'd be in, it'd be all, it would be catastrophic. So how does the Buddha grieve death? I, th I think, well, there's, there's one view, which is that the Buddha was so, oh, could you get the door? I do love that sound, but it's distracting. One view is that the Buddha realized so fully that he was the world, that he had come out of the world, that with the ending of his life, his, his uh, parinibbana, as they call it, that he simply became everything, and he knew that, so he would leave without much fuss, right? Um, there's another view, which I, I, I'm fond of. I've used this story for my own comfort many times, uh, it was Marpa, I believe, in Tibet, great one of the founders of Tibetan Buddhism, who had several children, and one of the children died, and he was weeping and wailing and doing what a parent might do if they weren't repressed. And one of his students came and said, Marpa, why are you freaking out like this? Don't you teach us that it's all an illusion? And his reply was very edifying, I think, was, of course it's an illusion, and the death of one's child is the most painful of those illusions and that both are true, it is a paradox, right? So the meditative journey, and why do we practice in community? It's because this is so hard to do. We need each other. And also we need community to help us, we need relationship to help us illuminate parts of our personality that we can't even see except in relationship. You know, there's that exciting moment when one's friend or partner says, um, honey, we need to talk. <laughs> that only gets illuminated <laughs> when in that circumstance. And in, there was a, years ago, there was a teacher's conference uh, that was held at Spirit Rock and 
doesn't matter, it was down in California. And the, there were a group of teachers from San Francisco Zen Center and Green Gulch, uh, which is the farm affiliated with that. And there were six or eight of them up there and one of them said, well, the way I understand community is that you take six, you, you take a few uh, pretty rigid, rough personalities and you put them in a grinder and you throw in some rouge, some, it's like a rock polisher, and you polish, and after a decade or two, there's some of the rough edges get really worn off through relationship with each other. Another reason for practicing community is that we, we tend to forget what's important, or we have a doubt attack and uh, we stop practicing. I had a celebratory moment recently with one of my guests to my office who, uh, who uh, has run into some real stress, real challenge, and uh, we celebrated together because they said, you know, this is the first time ever when, the, when, the, when it really got terrible that I thought, I'm going to go sit for an hour. Because <laughs> what we tend to do is to head for our favorite coping mechanism. Our ideologies, religions, arise out of the issue of death. The, what's going to happen when I die? Where did I come from? Well, here's a book that was written by human beings attributed to the divine thousands of years ago or recently and if you just believe on this, you'll be safe. And that leads to some comfort for, some, for many people. But depending upon the ideology, it can also lead to us behaving in the most heinous, weird ways. I may, I may just say this briefly. I was thinking to give a talk about this today, but I'm not really at fully prepared. But I've been researching um, the phenomenon of ISIS. And uh, it's a cult. It's a, it's a religious cult, which is based, it's an Armageddon cult. And their, their uh, task is to, they want to engage the Romans, which is the Western world, in a terrible war. And it's the war that will be the end of the world. It's the Armageddon War. And it will happen west of the city of Raqqa, which, which we have, we're bombing so much, our country is bombing so much that our, our supply of bombs is being depleted. Um, but the idea is that, that there will be a final battle which will be there and then the believers will be saved. And this has got a big draw on, some, on many people and it's got many different ways it, it presents itself. Um, and when that well, it's when, when, when ideologies like that get believed and then other ideologies meet them, then we actually have the battles. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons I was talking today about, about don't, the Buddha saying, don't believe me. That do the experiment and see if, in fact, you can't set yourself free from attachment to things 
and if you can't reduce your suffering and if you can't become more loving. And the, the wonder of insight meditation is that people become more loving, more tolerant, more compassionate uh, with themselves remark remarkably fast. Like 35 or 40 minutes we sat here and almost every hand in the room went up that you felt more sane. That's pretty interesting. It didn't require reading a book. It didn't require figuring something out. It simply required resting back into your true nature. Right? Resting back into being the world, which is what we are. How does one stay mindful and even compassionate while someone is trying to antagonize you or even has hatred towards you? That's a challenge, isn't it? A few weeks ago, we had some, some hecklers, four guys that showed up in sandwich boards outside, and they were very unhappy young men. And I was fortunate in that I didn't find them frightening at all. And... Uh, I, I mostly I, I know what it's like to be in a cult because I was for some years and 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 um, I also did adolescent residential treatment for some years and I saw kids behaving like that and I've seen myself behave I've seen myself in rage it's not a pretty sight uh, but I uh, I felt very open and and caring about them and, and I got a little too close, and one of them stuck his fist out at me and said, you're going to hell, and I was, I was too close. And uh, the fear arose, and I felt my right arm start to cock. It didn't go anywhere, right, but the intention arose. Wow, that's an interesting response. Too close and at risk. I stepped back, and that all went down again. Um, So we have to be safe, and I think the, the more, hmm, when we get a glimpse, when we get a glimpse of the fact that we are perfectly safe and that we are home, that we are the universe, when, that we are one with everything. When we get, even for a nanosecond, when that happens, it's spoken of as when we get a taste of the Dharma or a glimpse of the deathless, some things happen. One, among them, uh, doubt goes away, and uh, the belief in I am gets really softened, can never be the same as it was before. The belief in rituals, that rituals are magic and somehow can make us free, goes, goes away. And that's, that's in the Theravadan Buddhist world, that's known as the, the stream entry, first, first experience of freedom. Then the, the second uh, realization, uh, another glimpse of that, big glimpse, uh, results in a weakening of lust and hate. A weakening. Isn't that interesting? The first glimpse doesn't do anything to one's psychological and emotional structure at all. <laughs> the character, the personality is unchanged. However, the lights have clicked on for a second. Right? But then there's this weakening of lust and hate, and then the third, they say, is that lust and hate are just hugely attenuated. They just don't, don't arise so much. It's hard to provoke them. And then the, the, the ultimate, the arhat, the fully awakened person, uh, the, the, the remnants of I am get much, 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 much weaker, they say. But I can, I can speak with experience to the, the weakening of lust and hate. It just gets us, I used to have road rage. And now road rage looks absolutely Nuts. I mean, I know I understand it really personally, but but someone does something in their car that is maybe dangerous or unconscious, then they cut me off or whatever, 
And my movement is towards hatred of them and shaking a fist or whatever. What? That's strange. It's, it's like the, with the, the modern images. The, uh, you go to f you've got rats and you go to Home Depot and buy the poison and then you eat it yourself and you hope the rats will die. It's, I'm, go I'm going to get angry at him or her because they invaded my turf. It's a very odd thing. So, uh, I think that the way to stay, how does one stay mindful and even compassionate towards someone who's trying to antagonize you or even has hatred towards you? Uh, we have to be safe. We have to, we have to be sure we can take care of ourselves. We have to have clear boundaries and, and leave some circumstances. But, for instance, those fellows out front, they were really, they were hoping to stir us up. And they did, they, they provoked some people, of course, who had vulnerability to that. But um, taking responsibility for the vulnerability in ourselves is what helps us. That if, if something like that sets off fear or anger or some response, then that's our meditation object. That's where we need to pay attention because that's where we need healing. We need care sufficient that we don't take that primitive response as the truth. There's a quote, that, um, can't remember her name right now, uh, that the, the spiritual journey is a, a journey inwards and down, down through the, uh, the toil and the muck and the craziness of the human psyche. And, and we discover that we're doing this journey inwards and down with millions of other people. And this is in response to the question about meditation and therapy. Meditation can be used and can skillfully be used sometimes to suppress different states. Let's say I'm anxious and I really need to, come in. I'm anxious and I really need to perform in some way uh, it may be possible, sometimes it's possible, to get really concentrated on the breath and just calm the system down and, and lower the control rods into the reactor and become much more calm. And that's a very useful strategy. There's another strategy, which is when the anxiety is there, with as much clarity and love and compassion as I can, I turn awareness toward the symptom, toward the anxiety itself, toward the feelings in the body, toward the stories that are being told. And I open to them with as much love as I can. Because the way out truly is through. The way out is through opening. We discover over time that we are everything. We have, we have every mood and every, uh, every heinous impulse. Um, and we encounter what Carl Jung called the human shadow, and we become more and more able to be who we are, including the great darkness and the great anxiety and the great fear and the great rage, as well as more love, light, compassion, joy, wisdom than we ever dreamed. So, oh, and uh, to make the connection with therapy, which is my life's work, in a way, has been bringing Western psychotherapy together with the Dharma. And um, we've developed here in the West some beautifully articulated models of how we can help one another to heal, to come to grips with, to, to engage um, the places that we're wounded, the, the parts of ourselves that we don't have access to. The active ingredients are love, compassion, and awareness. Um, so, meditation and therapy are, I, I look, 
I look upon therapy practiced skillfully as it's a meditation for two. Two of us are focused on one of us and how the mind is creating stories and how there's, there's trauma stored away in places in the body and how we can open those in a context of great safety and love so that we can relax more and more and more. It's all about love, I think. And love meaning that there's room for everything, which I learned from Achan Sumedho, a Thai forest monk. Isn't that a nice definition? In love, there's room for everything. How can we live intentionally but without expectations? Well, the mind is creating intentions all the time. Before every action, there's an intention. And so we choose some intentions and we we then try to live into them and sometimes we can't do it. Sometimes you make an intention, I will never eat more than three mother's taffy cookies in a day and it doesn't work because there's a compulsive issue and we can fill in the blank. I always like doing this, this is fun. Please raise your hand if you have some addiction or compulsion that you know you would be better off without. <laughs> well, stop. <laughs> it's the, the conscious ego is a fragile island floating on a vast sea of unconsciousness we call the psyche and there exist within the psyche autonomous complexes which can and do usurp the ego. Right? The conscious ego is just one of the actors and meditation is really strengthening that and we can use it to come into relationship with the other parts but the other parts are real and are autonomous. Pretty big word. So yes, let's form our intentions and accept our failures. Communities at large are falling apart due to many different causes, et cetera, and how do we, how do we help people who are losing their homes? Um, PIMC's mission is to support those of us who want to practice this practice and do it in depth. And that will always be the main thrust of PIMC. And one of the, one of the risks to an organization is that we'll get, we'll get involved in uh, too many missions, too many uh, ac actions which are not uh, in keeping with our goal and therefore we get watered down. However, uh, I, I see as we mature more possibilities like this participating in this environmental walk today is one. Um, and how do, we t how do we take care of each other when we fall sick? What happens at this point is people disappear when they need help. And that's not true in, some, in many churches. There's a, there's a circumstance where there's, you can, so there's a, an organized way you can ask for help or you could ask for food or financial support. And I, I'd like to see us in time uh, do all that within the context of this, the primary mission is supporting people to do meditation practice in order to transform our lives. And then from that, we can make our impacts in the world. Not doing bad here. Time. Time is on my side. It takes a long time to teach children about time. Years. Three, four, five years. Hurry up, we'll be late. I watched the violence of that with my own children when they were little so many times. They were happily playing and 
We had to get them dressed and in the car and you have to pee again? It's like, hurry up. I'm going to be late for my meeting. Okay. Um, so what, what is time? I mean, what's, other than that, let me see. What do we really have? We have now. Right? Walking in these doors today is a memory. Walking out these doors this morning is a plan. It's a fantasy. The march, the walk this afternoon is a fantasy. It may not happen. Or I may not make it to get there. Uh, all of our memories of the past are just that. They're, they're, they all occur in the present moment. They're just now. There's only now, and there's, there's this, uh, I guess I can say this here. I'm making for my sisters uh, one of those online, you can, a photo book for Christmas. And uh, I've got 180 pictures of our childhood, little black and white pictures. That, and so I've been, I've been swimming around in my childhood for a few hours. And, oh, the stories are rife. Quite interesting. And the feelings and the this and the that. And I'm, I'm so aware of it is, this is all a fantasy. I have no idea if any of it is true. Some parts of my neurotic structure support that this happened and that happened. But... It's such a relief to realize, oh, this is the story of Robert's childhood. And it's important, helps with compassion, but in terms of how to live my life now, it's utterly irrelevant, because that's over. It's as over as the dinosaurs. My parents have been dead for 20 years and 22 years. If I have any hint of blaming them for anything now, what? That's insanity. I'm responsible. It's my life. Now, there are effects, many of them very good, but uh, so time, the, the deeper we go in our meditation, the more we realize that time is a fantasy. It's a useful fantasy because uh, this afternoon the march starts at a particular, when the clock gets to a certain point, we'll, and we'll coalesce there. Uh, but it'll, then it will be now because it's always only now. We are the earth singing and it's only now. Oh, nice. Good, good first line, don't you think? <clears throat> Is there a time of transition without a home? How can we find our true home? I think now is our true home. I remember I started with that beautiful poem or reading, we come out of the earth and being, being in our nowness, we're, we are the earth dancing, we're the earth singing, we are, we are, we belong here, we are here. <laughs> and, um, and there is no security and there's no stability. Only things we can really predict with certainty are that everything will dissolve. And we can form the intention along the way, I want to be as loving and compassionate as I possibly can. And use the, the constant and episodic crumbling as grist for the mill. Home. E.T. comes to mind. E.T. phone home. But he, in that, I mean, the home was somewhere else. It wasn't here. But 
But that is the big question, isn't it? Where will I go? What will happen? Where did I come from and where am I going? And I, I'm so grateful to the Buddha for emphasizing and teaching this whole body of teachings to, to practice being here, being here where we're actually alive. So let's just be present for a moment, being aware of being a body. Breathing in, breathing out. Right? To practice meditation without moving to some special posture. <laughs> to just be here. What is this mysterious capacity of being aware, for instance, of the life in our hands right now? How do you do that? Or the feeling of pressure in your buttocks and thighs. <coughs> Be aware of that. How do you do that? <laughs> or notice the mood that's present. The mood's a little more slippery, isn't it? But notice the mood that's present. Usually we think, we identify with the mood and we say, I am, I am happy, I am depressed, I am angry. But this is a radical shift from that. This is, oh, there's a mood. And I guess it'd be fun to play with time for a moment. Are you, do you have a plan for later today? Is there something you're going to do? Or something you intend to do that you'll likely avoid? <laughs> I always have some of those. <laughs> there's, a, there's a pattern in here of creating anxiety by avoiding things like doing the taxes for way too long. It's quite crazy. But that's, it creates a future. So think about this, something you're going to do. Are there, are there kids there? Not yet, no? Somebody's there? Would you check? So that's the future. A fantasy of something you're gonna do this afternoon. They're there. Well, so I predict, I'm going to predict the future that in a few seconds there will be a herd of small young humans coming in and I invite you all to come and form a circle and any of you who would like to join us in the center, the Sanctum Sanctorum, please do. Uh-oh, are we candleless? Huh? Yeah. Uh oh. Well, yeah, that'll work. Just hold it, there you go. Imagine that, our candle burned out. What's wrong with these candles? Is that your mom over there? 
It's nice to have a mom, isn't it? What's your badge? Huh? What's your badge? Oh, my badge. This is from Ruth Dennison, my teacher. All right. Can I slide my stiff leg out here? Thank you. All right. Let us be aware. Oh, let's let me rub our hands together and be aware of hands and heat. Can you make some heat? Hot. Can you start a fire? <laughs> All right. And then let's let our hands reach out and find other hands to hold. Thank you. May I hold your hand? Maybe just a hair. No, okay. So being aware of this mysterious living contact that we have, we are passing through a human lifetime. We have come out of the earth and we'll be here for a little while. We have this opportunity to actually touch one another and to wish each other well. So to the person on your left, giving their hand a little squeeze, I hope you have a wonderful day today and that you're safe and you feel happy. And I hope that you find your way to your meditation spot. And to the hand or foot on your right, <laughs> wishing this person well, may you be happy. And of course, we're wishing ourselves well since we are all sprung from the same place. And so let's extend this to all of our brothers and sisters all over this earth, to those who are being born right now, to those who are dying right now, to those on every side of every conflict, to our brothers and sisters of the air, the earth, and the water, We're all in one big soup. So let us wish each other well and also do what we can to be responsible for our impact on each other. So we have, we have the ancient ritual of the chant and the blowing out of the candles. Who is going to do the, you are, great. Thank you. Oh, both of you. Is the queen going to take her throne with her or just? <laughs> <laughs> okay. May all beings be happy and sadhu three times. Be calm. Get comfortable. <laughs> May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. done thank you and now the ancient counting and then the great blowing out and this is a moment of practicing patience before that are we ready is everyone in the room ready to blow breathing in deeply one two three blow Yes, your wishes are granted. So please come and join us uh, for some tea and goodies and also come to the walk this afternoon if you can. Thanks. Thank you. Fuzzy.
Is it fuzzy? Oh, I see. 